Welcome to another episode of Bangers and Classics from a very disgruntled crew at the Bangers and Classic uh, headquarters. Uh, we've had some software issues today and we are out for blood. Hello there, David. I mean, mm. you know, this is this is really, uh, you, you know, bringing, bringing to life the dangers of modern technology in that it can just let, let you down. Uh, mm. Whereas if, it, if everything was steam powered, uh, we'd, just, we'd just throw some more coal on the fire, wouldn't we? And we'd be fine. Absolutely. Or throw some software developers on the fire and we'd be fine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> with that rant out of the way, how has your stealth car spotting been going lately? Uh, extremely well. I, I don't I don't think I've seen anything particularly interesting for about a whole week. Um, uh, the only thing actually I did was um, I seemed to have run my uh, battery on my Land Rover flat. Some, some twit left something switched on. Uh, and again, it's coming back to technology, and that is the, the most low-tech vehicle that you can buy. Um, and I thought my five-month-old new battery um, uh, had completely gone, but uh, there was an item of electricity that was left on inside the vehicle, which I didn't realise, and that flattened the battery completely. So hopefully that's uh, that's it for technical issues uh, for this week. Um, otherwise, what have you spotted, David? Oh, absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> not, not a blooming thing. I have been looking for classic cars in my occasional travels. Yeah. Uh, I've seen nothing worth talking about, unfortunately. And the black MGB GT that uh, I thought was a GT, uh, having seen only the front, turns out to be an MGB Roadster. Um, not right. So there we go. Um, yet more talking rubbish for me. Um, <laughs> what about Emma Peel, the Emma Peel lookalike or wannabe? Have you seen her? Any more uh, reports? No, <laughs> no, I haven't. Well, see, the listeners, it, I'm sure, are desperate to know. Has been any further sightings? Um, well, you would, you would, you would think so. I mean, if she's a regular at uh, the local Waitrose, um, mm. uh, you know, I, I will have to time my visits to that area uh, when I fill up with petrol. But uh, well, uh, I think I filled up at Tesco's this time. My 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 other supermarket of choice. There are ah. other super, super, supermarkets available, of course, and I know there's a whole. Uh, a rabbit warren of of uh, disputes over whether you actually should go anywhere near um, a supermarket provider of uh, petrol at all. But uh, I also occasionally buy petrol at the most expensive place um, in Norfolk. They were once, my local garage was once on the local news and they were so proud of the fact that they were the most expensive <laughs> uh, place to fill up. But people still do actually. And uh, when petrol was uh, or, or is ever in short supply, uh, that's the place you can always rely on getting some. So it's only two miles away. Yes, well, my concern is that a lot of listeners think this lady doesn't exist. So I've got a proposal to put to you, and yeah. it involves taking the dust covers of the Bangers and Classics time machine. Is it still in good repair? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I use it um, on a very regular basis, uh, actually, to buy cheaper cheaper petrol. It works <laughs> very well for me. <laughs> and batteries. You need a few of those. Oh, cheap batteries. Yeah, I stock yeah. up on batteries. Yeah, very wise. Anyway, so since it's in good repair, my proposal is we zip back to 1980, uh, set the dials for a Sri Lankan beach, liberate Arthur C. Clarke from Terra Firma, bring him back here and get him on the case, and he will prove or disprove the existence of this mythical M appeal lookalike. Um, that will settle the matter once and for all. But I'm sure we can find some other uses for Arthur as well if we can only find him. Well, that's fair enough. Absolutely. All right. But I will go out of my way to try and stalk some poor woman who uh, probably doesn't want to be stalked. You know. And uh, uh, I'll rely on you to defend me in court, David, uh, when uh, when it uh, comes that far. Oh, God, you're a brave man then. Yeah. That's it. Just throw away the key now, mate. I mean, that's it. Just yeah. don't make any plans for the next 20 years. You've had your chips there. Yes, um, let's do this week's Bangor Classic. And we're going to go for an Italian car this week. It's the Alfa Romeo 166. What do you think, James? Is it a banger or is it a classic? Well, you see, when you first suggested this to me, um, maybe uh, I'm going a bit deaf um, or just stupid. Um, and I just thought you said, oh, Alpha 164. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's a classic, isn't it? But um, yeah, now you've, you've said it again and it's 166. I feel really silly because obviously that's far too new to be uh, a classic car, whereas uh, a 164 is actually quite an interesting shape, isn't it? Um, mm. I, I do like the idea of a 166 mainly because it, it isn't German um, or Japanese or anything else. It's a, you know, it, it's a, it's a large-ish Italian, um, you know, executive express, and um, there's not going to be many of those ever again. So we might as well celebrate the ones that we have. Um, what do you think? Yeah. 
The only thing is, I wouldn't say it's, it's too um, young. It was brought out in 1996, so the oldest ones are 25. So that puts them into certainly modern classic territory for me, James, I have to say. Mm. I think the trouble with the 166 is it suffers by comparison to the 164. The 164 was an iconic car. It was the last of the Alfa Romeos before Fiat took the company over. Well, the last car to be developed before Fiat came in and uh, took Alfa on board. You know, it looks great. It went pretty well. And, you know, it had some foibles. We all know about that. But it's a bona fide, you know, copper-plated classic. 166, well, let's think about it. It doesn't look too bad. It looks a bit looks different to the competition, which is always good. But it suffers in comparison to the 164. I just don't think it looks very strong compared to it. It doesn't have a very strong identity, a very strong personality in its looks. To my mind, anyway, others will probably disagree. Um, the real key to drive, and I found that out from, I had to drive one. My boss is 166 one day back in about 2002. Uh, it was a brand new car to drive it across to a court hearing um, across the fourth road bridge in the most horrendous fog ever. And the story is the court hearing was set for 11 o'clock. So I left Edinburgh heading across this other court. Uh, and a real peace super really concerned about prying the boss's car. Not for anything I would do, but because, you know, uh, unfortunately other people share the roads and they're not always as observant as they might be. Anyway, driving with velvet gloves, etc. I got to the court, half past 10, walked in, only to be told, oh, we've dealt with the case in your absence. Well, apart from the fact that they had called it half an hour early and um, without my consent, which they weren't supposed to do. So I'd risked my neck in the boss's new car going there. Um, but I did, um, you know, I did for the benefit of good weather on the way back and discovered a couple of things of the 166. Handles tidily enough, but in two litre form, the twin spark engine just isn't powerful enough for a car of that size. So I would say it's competent in two litre form, but it's just lacks, uh, lacks brio, to use the Italian term. Basically, my experience of it, the, the three litre version, it's got a Busso engine, anything with a Busso engine, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a dust cart with a Busso engine, it's a classic automatically because of the engine. But is a 266 a classic in twin spark, guys? That's the issue. What do you think, James? Well, it's got more than one spark, so... There you go. Um, but is it a bright, is it a bright spark? Is it, isn't it a bright spark? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you've probably got a good point there. But uh, yeah, I didn't realise it was so old. Really didn't. You know, that that gives you some, you know, I, I don't think 1996 is a long time ago. And I'm sure there's people listening to this uh, podcast who may not have been born in 1996. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it's, an, you know, it's an Alfa Romeo in a way. And they're not all good. Um, just because they're an Alfa Romeo, I, I know, I know there there is that um, sort of trope, isn't there? Really, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I give most things the benefit of the doubt, and uh, yeah, for me, it's a I'll let it be a classic. Okay, now I've won a couple of Alfa Romeo, so um, yeah, probably going to get excommunicated communicated from the Alfa Romeo ranks for this. <laughs> Three litre version or any V6 version. I'm not sure if it's available on two and a half litre. I didn't bother to check, uh, but it's got a Busso engine. It's a classic. The twin spark engine, though some people swear by it, wasn't the greatest. And I'm going to get pelters for this, I'm sure. But um, of the two engines, uh, the Busso is easily the better. And for that reason, I'm going to say it's a classic for the Busso and probably in a sort of limbo land for the two litre. You can you can send flowers once the, the twin spark guy and get hold of me, James, okay? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Oh, send chocolates. I might just be hospitalised. You don't know. I mean, yeah. because, I, <laughs> because I owned a couple of alphas, they might let me off with yeah. just the odd broken leg or whatever. That's right. I'll bring grapes, don't worry. And uh, yes. Lucasade, one of those big Lucasades that I never understood people got when they are in hospital. But there you go. Oh, God, that was brewing stuff, though. When you were a kid, I mean, surely, James, yeah. in the old days, you could have a broken mm. leg. You could, you know, you could have been hit by an express train. A glass of Lucasade was put in front of you, drank it. Miraculously, you were better. Yeah, I think it was different stuff then. I think you're probably yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable stuff. Um, Frankenstein didn't need to go to the expense of setting up electricity. She just to give him the monster glass of Lucas Aid. Absolutely. And enough to reanimate it. Yeah. And in the old days, of course. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, but it, and, it, and it used to come in its own wrapping, didn't it? You see, that, that, that was the thing. And again, we're only talking to people who are, who are as old as us. But uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it did have it, its own it? cellophane wrapping, which was That's true. very curious, really. I don't I didn't mm. understand that either. But there you go. That was possibly part of the secret recipe. Yeah. But yes, there we go. Let's move swiftly on now. Embarrassing car stories. I've got one for you. 
And I'm going to name check somebody here. It's a chap called Ross. I won't give you a surname, but Ross, this is for you because you did this. Many years ago, well, about 12 years ago, I bought a Lucillan. It was the last one I ever bought and I'd owned it for a day. I was sitting in my driveway and my mate Ross came around, chatted for five minutes, said, I've got to go. Can you give me a hand? I need to switch the cars around to put the Lotus in the garage. Sure. So I get into the Lotus, he get into the Citroen that was in front of it. And you know, I was getting the car started, checking the mirror, making sure nobody was walking behind me. Then, boom, what the hell's happened there? Ross had contrived to reverse the Citroen into the front of the Lotus. Uh, for whatever reason, he'd been sitting riding the clutch and his foot had slipped off it. Remarkably enough, though, given Lotus's reputation, which is uh, largely undeserved in my experience, any damage to it polished out. There was a couple of scratches on it, they polished out. He never lived that down, and he's still not getting to live it down. So there you go, mate. That one's for you. So, James, uh, have you got one for us, or should we move no, on to something else? I'd move on to something else, really. I, I just think having a flat battery uh, this week, that, that there you go, so I'm... I'm always updating my embarrassing stories because there's just so many of them. So there you go. Yeah. Well, I know it's been said of me that I only open my mouth to change feet. So there you go. <laughs> anyway, moving on. You were going to talk about watches, I think, at one stage, weren't you? What, was I really? Um, I think you should. Well, well, they're not actually watches, are they? They're, they're clocks. They are, they are ab- absolutely clocks. So that's that. That's how people refer to them in the um, uh, in the car business. And uh, if you, I mean, you, you, you could in the old days have a Smith's watch. I know that Smith's has been bought out and there is a, there is a man actually who, who runs it and it, and it is a British company again. Uh, but yeah, if you, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, um, the clocks, um, on, uh, you know, a BMC car, a Jaguar or whatever, you will find, um, that they've got Smith's written on them and you could buy watches, uh, many years ago. And you can, as I say, mm. you can, again, they, they're quite expensive now. Uh, they also but, made crisps as well. They did absolutely, those, yeah, with those little blue packets uh, in, inside them. Um, and you know, uh, you had Jaeger Jaeger clocks, um, oh. you know, in your Citroens, didn't, didn't you? So you know, it's um, so all the best, you know, names um, have been associated with uh, watches and clocks. And over the years, obviously, with motor racing and stuff, uh, I think clocks have been or clocks or watches are, you know, much more associated with, um, you know, racing. And uh, you know, I suppose you think of Steve McQueen, mm. uh, iconic, iconically wearing um, uh, uh, a Hero watch. It was um, a monocle, wasn't it? I think he wore Yeah, that's right. Um, and things like that. So, yeah, it, it's sort of, you know, watches have been a car thing. Although I do understand that there are car people who who don't get watches. But uh, watches, you don't need to put them in a garage. You can put them in a box. And uh, so they're uh, usually, um, you know, much more easy uh, to look after. Although they, they do need servicing. And uh, one thing I would say is if you do have a decent watch and you are supposed to really get it serviced every five years, I think sometimes it's a bit of a rip-off. Uh, I do know some people who've got watches that are so expensive to service, they don't use them anymore, <laughs> which goes against the whole point of using of using a watch or having a watch. Um, uh, but, I mean, you'll be pleased to hear, um, uh, listeners, that uh, I favour watches that don't cost as much as a car. So all my watches are are cheap and cheerful. Um, uh, and sometimes even less than that. Uh, but I, I quite enjoy buying watches, which, um, you know, which, which are Swiss watches. So these days, buy a Swiss watch, you know, you're going to talk about a grand most, in most cases, at least. Well, I've never paid anywhere near that for uh, the Swiss watches that I buy. Um, and the thing about watches, it's a bit like buying cars in that you're not quite sure whether they're going to work or not. Um, because you know, it could work. It, it, it may not work uh, because they're complex items. Uh, sometimes you can make them work even. Um, so in a way, that's half the fun of having them. But I would say um, uh, watches look reasonably good for men. It's the only form of acceptable jewellery. Um, and you can make a car connection um, uh, with them. And it's probably very important to, to wear the right sort of watch when you're driving the, the right sort of car. Uh, but yeah, I, I would just argue with people that they should um, not spend very much money on them and um, then you can have a lot. So that's what I do, really. I've got boxes of the things, but I quite like them. You know, I like, I, I like them aesthetically. And uh, if they have a moating correct connection, then that's great. But um, yeah, I'm probably just a bit weird 
Uh, I don't know about you, David. I mean, you know, you being a lawyer, you've probably got to watch that's the size of a planet or something. But, oh, no, no. Yeah. no. I, I never liked oversized watches. I always yeah. was deeply suspicious of guys who wore oversized watches. You know, um, I always wanted to go up to somebody who was sitting with an oversized watch and sort of put a fried egg or something on top of it. Oh, yeah. sorry, mate, I thought it was your plate, you know. Not my not my thing, really. I mean, uh, I never learned the big hand, the difference between the big hand and the little hand anyway, yeah. so I, I did struggle. Uh, yeah. I do have a Mickey. I do have a Mickey Mouse watch, and apparently he's got one of me as well. So that's quite good. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I've got a Tissot watch somewhere, a Swiss watch that was bought for me. But mm. um, damn it, if I can find it, I don't know where it's really? gone. Yeah, it's about somewhere. I'm just, I'm just not really that interested. Uh, Eccentric only... multi-millionaire David Malloy there. Oh, I'm, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I wish I was. No, I wish yes. I had a. The only watches that really interest me is maybe there's maybe two or three. Um, one is the Hoyer Monaco, I think it is that McQueen yeah. wore in Le Mans, and that's just because of the film connection. That's really it. It's not a tag Hoyer; it's the original Hoyer. The mm. modern one's not interested in. Other one is a Zodiac Sea Wolf, just because of the Sea Wolf thing. It's a long story, just a name I like. And if you look at have a look at my own website, you'll see there's a logo on it, and that's a Sea Wolf. Nothing to do with the watch; it's just something that appealed to me. And the third one, I can't remember what it was now. Oh, yeah, it was an Omega Seamaster, the original Omega Seamaster. It's quite a nice watch. But I just wouldn't want one. I wouldn't want to shell out that sort of money for, you know, something that tells the time. Talking of watches, you like this story, James. Yeah. Uh, this happened to me twice in Glasgow in space for about a couple of years. What I remember, the first time I was walking through a car park, I'd been visiting um, an office in connection with my job. I was walking through the car park, and a guy with what looked like a sort of two-week-old fish supper sticking out of his jacket pocket, bottle of iron brew in the other pocket, you know, the stereotype, comes up to me, says, oh, all right, Jimmy, like, oh, what's going on here? Uh, could you tell me the date? Like, Not the time, the date. I thought, brilliant, I love this. So, yeah, I told him I, I told him the date, and off he went quite happy. And the same thing happened to me in one of the big streets in Glasgow a couple of years later. A guy stopped me and says, uh, all right, pal, you got the date on you? Like, yeah, fine. There you go. Cheers. And off he walked. You know, <laughs> the guys looked like the skint knuckles from dragging them along the road behind them, etc. Really big, aggressive looking guys. But they were fine. They were just, all they wanted to know was the date. Um, you know, but always, it's, always, it's always tickled me that <laughs> somebody is so far off the grid as to not know the date. And I kind of like that. I respect that, actually, I have to say. Yeah, but no, I mean, uh, time is an artificial construct at the end of the day. So, um, you know, why, you know, why go along with it? Let's uh, let's march to our own beat. Eat, well, eat I mean, when we're hungry, sleep when we're tired. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are those that say time's not linear anyway. It just just gives the impression of being linear, whatever yeah. that is. So, uh, but who, who cares really? I mean, so anyway, enough, enough of watches because quite frankly, you're making me feel sad. I've only got one watch and I can't find the other one. So uh, we'll move on now to something else. And we're going to bust a myth today, James. Would you like to do that? Oh, I don't, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think you were going to do some myth busting. Um, yes. Because, because gonna... you, you, you made me read one of your features and I couldn't stop reading it. I had to, I had to read it to the end. I mean, I yeah. took... I mean, it took that would it, be a real chore. It took, it took 10 minutes of my life that I hadn't planned to... Uh, That's why you... That, so, uh, and that's why you got a knighthood in the post last week that's been kept quiet, not in press yet. But James read one of my stories to the end, and that's it. He's got a knighthood for it. So he's, he's now Sir James Ropper, OBD. Well, I was David Malloy, NBG. And if you're of a certain age, you know what NBG stands for. No blooming good. No. <laughs> anyway, yeah. And the myth is about the Italian job. Um, the 1969 film, not the not terribly good 2003 Hollywood remake. And the myth is that an Aston Martin DB4 convertible was destroyed uh, when the Mafia, or the guys playing the Mafia, tipped it over the edge of a cliff. The reality is the Aston Martin survived that. It wasn't ever tipped over the cliff. Um, the film company had bought it, I am told, for £900, and they possibly would have tipped it over the cliff, but on the first attempt, the Caterpillar they were using made a bit of a mess of it, and it didn't go over the cliff, but they did, they did do some damage to the car. So they thought, what do we do? And they hastily acquired um, a Lancia Flaminia convertible. And if you look at the film, the section where the Aston is flipped over the cliff, if you've got a DVD, it's better than that because you can freeze frame it and go through it in slow motion. If you watch it very carefully, you'll see that there's two sequences. The first part, DB4's roof and the windscreen pillars are destroyed by the Caterpillar. Uh, and the second part, you see it being launched over the precipice to its doom. 
except it's not a DB4, it's not even an Aston Martin, it's a Lancia Flaminia. And the reason you can tell this, if you actually look, that through the magic of movies, it's been converted from right-hand drive to left-hand drive. The bonnet no longer hinges at the front, but at the rear, and the rear, the rear wheel arch rooms are different. Um, so there you go. That was not an Aston that was chucked over the cliff, and I'm pleased to say it. The E-types in the film also um, survived. They weren't chucked over either. Uh, the DB4, though, was repaired. Uh, it still exists today, but if you're interested, if you like Benny Hill, uh, as James and I obviously do, and we model our, ourselves on him in all respects of our life, uh, well, almost all respects of our life, the DB4 appeared in an episode of the Benny Hill TV show in 1970 with the same registration plate on it. I can't remember the name of the episode, but it's on YouTube, and if you check it out, you'll find it there. So there you go. One myth has now been busted. Fantastic. Yeah, the next thing we're looking at here as we batter through this episode and our rage at uh, having the time available to us truncated massively um, <laughs> is you're going to give us the, uh, in your capacity as Lord James Ruppert, uh, mm. or sorry, Sir James Ruppert, sorry, you haven't got the, the promotion to Lord yet, um, The Gentleman's Guide to 1980s Beamers. It's something you're very, very familiar with, isn't it? Uh, just slightly uh uh, David, I but I don't know how much I'm plugged into what people are actually wanting to do now um, because I think BMWs from that era have sort of crossed a, a divide really, whereas they were extremely affordable up until a couple of years ago and now they're starting to become unaffordable really. I mean, I remember p- pointing someone in the direction of a 3 Series just a couple of years ago, somebody who who wanted one. And it was like 800 quid and it was, you know, had a full MOT and it was quite tidy. And I don't think they go for that anymore. Um, no. Certainly if you go for, uh, you know, the desirable stuff like 635s, they're sort of, you know, well over 14, 15, and they'll go, you know, beyond 20 if they're any good. Um, but with all of these, like all old cars, whenever we talk about bangers and classics, um, it's a good old rust, um, which finishes them off. And uh, if you don't catch it in time, then it's going to cost you a lot of money to sort out. And that's always going to be the case, really. They, they, again, there used to be a period when you would see um, the original owners with their with their cars. There used to be a lady who lived near to me, and she had a... Um, uh, um, we're going back to the seventies and, and sixties, which is uh, a two double o two, and and you could you, and you could tell that it was you know a car she bought brand new and she just kept it because that's what people do, and uh, it sort of brings us back to a conversation we had the other the other week about you know um, uh, moneyed people, um, you know they will buy a quality product and then they will keep it <laughs> and keep it running. Um, and in the ideal world, what you wanted to do was, uh, um, what, what you should try and do is buy five series, three series, um, and six series, and maybe seven series, and and readers. That's it. That's it for for cars from that period. There are there are no weird, um, you know, uh, oddly made up uh, cars uh, models that uh, nobody really wants to buy. Uh, beyond that, um, but you but yeah, if you can get one that's uh, a family owned one, that's great. Uh, buy an enthusiast one uh, but a lot of the ones that were run into the ground have been run into the ground and crushed unfortunately but it's just trying to find the ones that um, uh, haven't been been abused really um, uh, and uh, it is it is a matter of luck but really you you're, you're just looking for rust you're just looking for uh, cars that haven't been slammed uh, and modified in any way because you know to put them back to normal in many cases just isn't worth it or it's going to cost you a lot of money. You just want a nice clean car. And quite often mm. it's the really basic ones. You know, it, it is like buying a very basic, you know, 318 or a 316, um, which might which might be the best way forward. If you go back to look at 3 Series, yeah. um, obviously the 3 Series, uh, there was a changing of the guard, I think, in the early 80s there from the E21 to the E30. Which would you prefer, James, of the two? Which would you recommend? I think you've got an E21, haven't you? We've got an E21, um, and that feels to me like a very modern car. But you see, I was there when it when it was on the cusp, uh, when things changed. Um, you could still just about buy three. Well, they kept the 316 um, E21 going for a bit longer, I think, just to use up body shells and engines and stuff. Um, so in 1983, you could still buy them new. You know, you could still find them registered for new. And I think maybe into 1984, they were still they were still finding them. Um, but they, in in many ways, they're quite similar cars. Um, uh, the E30 is is probably better. Um, you might be hear someone trying to cut down a tree in the background, but uh, hopefully it won't hit me. Um, 
<laughs> but the E30 is a more modern car and probably a better car. But the E21, if again, if you can find them, and if you can find them in decent decent condition, are surprisingly modern. I I find, but uh, the E30 is probably a better car uh, on a day day to day basis. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got um, uh, quite sophisticated uh, fuel injection. If that goes wrong, that's like a pain. But um, is that mechanical fuel injection, James? Uh, uh, that will be the Kugel Fisher. Yeah, um, I yeah. don't know. Right. I, I think um, I think it's. Um, I mean, they were starting to get. I mean, it's it's a bit like mine has electronic ignition, and you know that's a fairly old car, really. So that's you know it was getting uh, electrics uh, quite early. I don't think it was Kugel Fisher for the E30. I can't remember now because obviously I've done no research for you, David. Um, <laughs> and I didn't know you were going to ask me difficult questions. You know, to, oh, you know always, James, always questions that are going to make me look stupid. But um, uh, but really, you. I mean, it is. It is just luck, and it and it will take time. I mean, again, it's the thing not to not to rush these things. You, you know, you can't sort of make your mind up on a Monday and then by Tuesday have bought one. You know, you've got to spend you've got to spend time looking. You've got to mm. talk to lots of people. Uh, yeah. And as you've mentioned before, you know, you, you talk to some of the people involved with clubs and just people who've who've owned them um, it is always very very good. Um, but yeah, I mean, they just they are just magnificent looking vehicles now. Um, you know, when you compare them to the way BMWs look now, they 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 look fairly horrendous, really, and they don't look very well designed. Whereas they were quite minimal. Um, and again, there's uh, as I said before, there are minimal models to look at. There's just small, medium, large, and a coupe, and that's it. Ah, there is one more you've forgotten. Have there? Yeah. The only, okay, it's, it, it probably wasn't readily available in 1989. The said one. Oh, I think right. The, yeah. That mm. come out just just probably scraped in yeah. to the eighties. Yeah. That's that's the one that really appeals to me. Always yeah. has, but you couldn't buy one for love of money unless well, you could do, but it's a lot of money. Well, they it's, were uh, discounted. There was, um, you see, at the time, a lot of people did think, "Ah, oh, that's going to be worth a lot," and that actually coincided with um, uh, everything. You know, the uh, economy tanking at the end mm. of the eighties, beginning, beginning of, yeah. of of the nineties. So I know some people who made uh, a very quick killing. But after yeah. that, if you paid over the odds for one, you were stuck with it. And actually, for a while, they were very difficult to get rid of, and they were discounted. Yeah, they came down in price. I mean, I remember mm. when they came out. I actually remember reading people were selling their place in the queue. Mm, yeah, um, making money. same as the thing what happened with the Toyota Yaris um, was GR recently. People get into the queue for one and sold the place. I bought the car early, got an early one, sold it for a premium, made some money on it. That happened with the Z one, but only for a few months because, as we all know. I remember I was training to be a lawyer in 1919. Uh, the interest rates, etc., went absolutely through the roof overnight. I think they went from about 5% to 16% in the space of 24 hours. It just went absolutely crazy. And that killed the classic car market. And indeed, the car market, stone dead from its previous high, because 89 at that time was the best year the motor industry in Britain had ever had, mm. um, statistically anyway. Because um, I remember that because I, had, I used it successfully in a case one switcher. I, I won't go into it, but... Uh, Knowing a bit about cars occasionally did, did help me in my job. But yeah, so BMW from the 80s, pretty much a, a good buy if you can find the right one, just like any other car, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. It's all the same. All all cars are the same. It's just got different badges. Mm. There you go. Mm. Let, let, let's throw that out there and see if anybody oh, listening, oh, oh. listening would disagree with that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it is the case. That's, that's it. That's it. He, he said it, listeners, not me. I'm, I'm taking a neutral stance on this one. <laughs> anyway, it's time for the klaxon. The new book I've been working on with an illustrator called Russell Wallace has hit the shelves on Amazon. I won't go into a lot of detail about it because you don't want to hear me rant on about things I've done. So basically it's called Lesser Spotted Classics. It's a series of short essays, about 21, well actually there's 22 because we had, had to add another one into it. Uh, 21 cars um, that are very rare sites in British roads. And for every car, Russ has drawn a bespoke illustration. It's all in black and white. It's calibrated to work well with the quality of paper that Amazon use. And indeed, um, looking at the pre-production copies that we ordered, it works out very well indeed. Um, not very expensive. It's, it's a landscape format book. Because of the formatting that Russ came up with, it's actually quite a slim book. But there's still quite a lot of words in it. Uh, still quite a lot of content in it. Um, £6.50 and... 25% of our royalties will go to charity. You can find it via the Bangers and Classic uh, Twitter page. 
Um, details are on there and it takes you to my website, tells a little bit more about it, but not very much because the bottom line is I'm not one for bringing up anything I've ever done. Um, I like it, Russ likes it, and all we can say is that you know, the two of us hope that other people like it too. I think there's one more thing we wanted to talk about this week, James, very, very quickly, wasn't there? Was there? <laughs> that was you your got, suggestion. I'm looking, yeah. I'm looking at my list with it. We'll you, suggested, you, you suggested. You <laughs> suggested. <laughs> Well, I suppose, oh, it, uh, yeah, I, I suppose it, yeah, it's a tiny bit, I mean, in a way, it's got nothing to do with bangers or classics, but in a way, it sort of uh, reassures me that, um, you know, we, we just concern ourselves with, with bangers and classics. Um, but it's just the people who uh, run Kazoo, I think it is, isn't it? Kazoo, Kazoo, um, one of those uh, uh, companies that um, uh, that delivers cars to your door, which, you know, it sounds like a, a brand new thing, but I'm telling you, you know, this has been going on since the dawn of time. And, you know, I remember delivering cars to people's houses because you'd do that because you'd sell a car, you know, and they'd, and they'd be very grateful and nice and they'd come back and buy another car from you. But, you know, they make it like it's some amazing thing and, and it really isn't. Um, but it's just the fact that um, the way modern business works. And now I've been doing businessy things for a long time and uh the bottom line is the bottom line you really do have to make some money out of something otherwise mm. what's the point but the way modern business works is that you get lots of people to invest you get rounds of funding and all sorts of nonsense like that and so the people at uh, kazoo or whoever their company called um uh, are making 145 pounds a car and I suppose, you know, there's no reason to feel sorry for them because they've set this up. But in the real world, you know, you talk to anybody in the car trade, you, you know, that that doesn't make the wheels go round on a used car business by making 140. But I mean, you might occasionally might have to make 145 pounds profit on a car because that's just the way things go sometimes. But as an average profit on a used car, it's just... <laughs> It's just risible, you know. You just, uh, as I say, you can't, you couldn't sustain that unless you were selling some frightening number of cars. But you wouldn't be able to generate enough to buy replacement cars, and that's the way it really should work. Uh, mm. But there you go. I just, I just find it weird. It's just, you know, this is being celebrated as, you know, you know, the new way of doing business. Whereas to me, it's exactly the way people have been doing business for many years. But it's less and less personal. Um, yeah. And, that's yeah, I, I I think that's that's part of it. You know, you really should should just go to your local dealer, make friends with them, and uh, you know they'll sort you out a nice car or just have a. You know, it's just it's just nice to do it like that rather than some big corporate conglomerate, um, uh, you know, investment vehicle, which um, this sort of seems to be. Really, I don't mm. I don't I don't really understand modern business. Is what I'm saying in a very complicated way. And uh, yeah, for people who worked in the car business and know that actually uh, ripping people off, which obviously this company doesn't do and you should never do because that's a terrible way to do business um, in whatever business you do. So yeah, what I'm struggling, I'm struggling to get to is I don't really understand it at all. And if somebody can explain right. it to me, uh, especially on the back of an envelope, um, you know, how you make £145 a car, because maybe that's what we should be doing, David. You know, we should be doing the bangers and classics. And if we made £245 a car, then maybe someone would buy us out for several billion pounds or something. But Yeah, we could try it. We could try it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, James, the only thing I say about cars is, is mm. that represents a turnaround for them because they started, I think, um, just before 2020, mm. and the figure of 100, I think it was 145 pounds of profit per car yeah. for the first quarter of this year. The corresponding period last year, it was rather less rosy. It was 287 pounds <laughs> loss yeah. per car. car. But what I'd say is 145 pounds of thereabouts that they're making per car sold. And I think they sold about 10,000 in total. Yeah. Uh, in the first quarter, was in a boom time for, for mm. car sales. Yeah. Everything's gone up in price. Cars have gone up in price. Mm. Whether the classics or not, boats have gone up in price. All watches, I imagine, have gone up in price um, of late. But that's because the the demand's there, and supply isn't quite the same. Um, so they're selling a lot. They're selling cars at a good time. Uh, from the point of view of making money on them, they're not making that much. Um, they do seem to be very, very well funded, mm. has to be said, and they're moving into a couple of other countries, I believe. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Um, if that's what people want, then fine. But personally, uh, I'm like you, James. I'd rather go and wander around the forecourt, have a look at cars, test the horn, kick the tires, etc., and chat to somebody. 
But yeah. um, we were old school. You know, that, that's just it. And uh, not everybody shares that. Um, you know, not everybody shares our view. But uh, I think there'll come a time when people will regret losing the ability to go to showrooms, to go to shops, and to actually look at things. Um, if, it's a, if it's clothing, feel the quality of it, um, see how it looks. Uh, even if it's a watch, just get a, a proper visual impression of it before you actually shell out the money because you buy stuff off the internet, you don't know how it's going to look. Obviously, a you know, nice book looks great. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> got to add that bit in. But in general terms, you know, you buy a lot of things and it is very much hit and miss because what you see um, doesn't tell the whole story. You see a picture of something, doesn't tell you the weight of it. You don't see the quality of the materials and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, that's my two pen than that. And I think uh, that's... Uh, I think that's enough for this week. We've rattled through this one uh, in one take. We haven't bothered to have a break this week simply because we've had very little time left thanks to um, the Zencaster not working properly. So, and on that note, I'll say it's goodbye from him. Uh, Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. See you again.